Hello, sexy people. This is Jackie with the latest episode of The Sexy Politico and the last episode for 2020. Today, we're looking at the history of women in the United States Army. You might ask why? Since the U.S. has a citizen army and they're not really a part of the government, but they are a part of the government. So why would I give a rat's butt? Well, to be fair, I was in the army for 45 days. I was discharged medically due to a tremor that I have. My mother was in the military for four years, five years. She was in the military before I was born. And honestly, we wouldn't have a government without an army to, to to defend it and research that I've just done shows that women have been willing to lay down their lives for this country if ever since its revolution. So when were women legally allowed to join the army? Well I guess it depends on what you're looking at but the first time that women were allowed to join a military-ish was in 1901 when the Army Nurses Corps was created, but in reality women fought in war since the American Revolution. Before the creation of the Army Nurses Corps, women fought in wars, but they did so in men's clothing using fake names. So we don't know exactly how many women fought in these wars. Or so, let's look at two women that we do know. The first one being Deborah Sampson. Excuse me, I have a cold. So Deborah Sampson, she fought bravely under the name of Robert Shirtland. She was assigned under George Webb's company of light infantry. She was a scout under neutral territory and she helped figure out where George Washington would attack. Now this woman, wanted to fight in the revolution so hard that when she was shot in the thigh, she pulled the bullet out herself in order so that her gender wouldn't be discovered. But she got sick. She lost consciousness and the doctor then found out who she was after she was taken, she was taken off the battlefield. But she received a full military pension. She was honorably discharged. And her husband, after she passed away, petitioned for a spousal pension, similar to what women receive for men. And this pension was granted, even though he died before he ever received it. Sally St. Clair is the first woman known to have ever died in a in battle. She died in the Battle of Savannah in 1782. There's very little known about her. She's described in by some as a Creole woman, some as a woman of color, some as mixed African and French. The only thing that seems to be known is that she's from South Carolina and that her true gender wasn't known until her death. In the Civil War, there is an there was an estimated four to seven hundred women who fought wearing with men's names, wearing men's clothing, but nobody can know that for sure. Harriet Tubman worked for the Union Army, first as a scout and a nurse, and then as an army scout and spy. She was the first to lead an armed expedition in war, the first woman to lead an armed expedition in war, and she guided a raid on Kumhi Ferry and liberated more than 700 slaves. I think this uh, might be a good time for us to take a little bit of a commercial break and learn a little bit more about Anchor, which I'm using right now to record this podcast. Before we can talk about women in the regular army, we have to talk about the Army Nurses Corps. So the Army Nurses Corps was established in 1901. Before 1901, nursing wasn't really professionalized. Excuse me. Women did tend to the sick and the dying, but in but there wasn't really a medical department for that. I mean, really, there wasn't a medical department for the U.S. Army until 1812. The during the Civil War, the Secretary of War under Abraham Lincoln 
appointed Dorothea Dix as superintendent of women's nurse nurses for the Union Army. And before reporting to their assignment, these quote unquote nurses would receive a short course in nursing under Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, who is the first woman to receive a medical degree in the United States. Some of the nurses who worked for under Union hospitals weren't actually on the Army's payroll. They were sponsored by the United States Sanitary Commission or by other volunteer organizations. And their work was largely limited to giving out food and distributing supplies at furnished by volunteer groups, so really nothing too substantial. But during the Spanish-American War, the Army hired female civilian nurses to help with the wounded. So Dr. Anita Newcomb McGee was appointed as the acting assistant surgeon in the United States Army, and after the Spanish-American War ended, McGee wanted the establishment of a permanent nurses' corps. She wrote to the Ar she rewrote the section of the Army Reorganization Act pertaining to nursing, and this is the founding of the Army Nurses Corps. So 1,500 women nurses worked as contract nurses during the 1898 conflict. So what the big thing with the Army Nurses Corps is that it was for white women only, and they actually wanted to minimize the number of non-white women until 1947 so until well into the second world war and they also excluded all men until the korean war when male doctors emphasized the need for nurses on the front line because at this point women weren't allowed on the front lines at all i mean that did not happen for a long time so we're looking at the the establishment of the Army Nurses Corps fell under this line of progressivism that came about in the early 1900s. I mean, this is the same time where everything was getting professionalized and expertise was just all over the place. So the Army Nurses Corps became a permanent part of the medical department on the 2nd of February, 1901. They were appointed in the regular army for a three-year period, although these nurses were not actually commissioned as officers in the regular army until 1947. Dita Kinley was officially appointed the first superintendent of the Army Nurses Corps in March of 1901. Kinney served as superintendent until 1909. The number of nurses on active duty hovered about 100 in the first years of the creation of the Corps, with the two largest groups serving at the General Hospital in Pestito in San Francisco and in Manila. So with the First World War, we needed more nurses. So the Army recruited about 20,000 registered nurses. So these are women who actually were trained in nursing at regular at regular nursing schools the first women to pass away while on the line of duty under their own names were edith ayers and helen woods they were in the same they were in the same unit they died on a boat now let's move forward to the 40s so the women's auxiliary auxiliary corps of 1942 renamed the, Ar the Women's Army Corps in 1943, was founded and about 150,000 women served in the Women's Army Corps during World War II. In January 1943, Captain Frances Keegan Marquis became the first woman to command an expeditionary force. The 149th WAC Post Headquarter Company, they served General Eisenhower's North African Company. They were headquartered in Algiers. This group had about 200 women. They performed secretarial, driving, postal, and other non-combative duties. In May of 43, Dr. Margaret K. Craig Hill became the first female doctor to be commis a commissioned officer in the Army Medical Corps. She was assigned as the women's consultant of the Surgeon General of the United States Army. They dealt with the Women's Health and Welfare Unit, and they were responsible for inspections of field conditions for the women. They 
included providing medical care after enlistment and recommending hygiene courses and preventative measures, as well as the standards for screening applicate applicants for the WAC and for other for other women's stuff. She also met with the Board of Army Doctors to create a standard of acceptability for those and these were published. She was also responsible for advising on assignments for women medical officers. She recommended that women were assigned to positions that they were based on their professional qualifications rather than their gender. Now, an interesting fact I found online is that the Angels of Bataan and were members of the Army Nurses Corps and they were stationed in the Philippines at the onset of the Pacific Arena during World War II and they served the Battle of the Philippines when Bataan and the Cordigers fell to J the Japanese in 42, 66 Army nurses and 11 Navy nurses and one nurse anesthetician were captured and imprisoned around Manila. They were they continued to serve as nurses throughout their status as prisoners of war. After years of being POWs, they were finally liberated in February of 45. So these women, after serving World War II, joined they joined the reserves and they were involuntarily recalled during the Korean conflict. No women Army Corps units were sent to Korea. Approximately a dozen wax were uh, were and one officer served in Seoul and Busan during as secretaries translators and administrative positions um so in 52 and 53 many people in the wax served in Japan and other overseas locations over 500 army nurses have served in combat zones and many were assigned to large hospitals in Japan one army nurse died in a plane on her way to Korea in July of 1950, shortly after the hostilities began there. Now, during the Vietnam War, a new line was a new law was signed in, which removed the legal ceiling of women's promotions that had kept them out of being generals and other and other higher ranking positions. So. Women's Army Corps soldiers served in the Vietnam War, peaking in 1970. The WAC presence in Vietnam consisted of 20 officers and 130 enlisted women. During the war, Anna Mae Hayes, Chief of the Army Nurses Corps, became the first female Brigadier General in July 11, 1970. Well, and then a couple minutes later, Elizabeth Hoistings, Director of the Women's Army Corps, became the second. During Vietnam, only one female was killed in the line of fire, which was First Lieutenant Sharon Ann Lane, an Army nurse. Two other Army nurses were awarded the Soldier's Medal for Heroism in Vietnam. Diane Lindsay was cited for restraining a Vietnamese patient who had pulled a pin from, live from a live grenade at the 95th Evacuation Hospital. First Lieutenant Lindsay helped convince the soldier to release a second grenade, avoiding any additional casualties. Now, West Point began admitting female cadets in 1976 after Congress authorized the admission of women into federal service academies in 1975. Four years later, 62 female cadets of the original 119 had graduated, and in 1989, Kristen Baker became the first female first captain, and Rebecca Marrier became the Academy's first female valedictorian in 1995. In 1978, the Women's Army Corps was established and its members integrated into the regular army. In April of 1993, the combat exclusion was lifted from aviation positions, permitting women to serve in almost any aviation capacity. In 94, the Pentagon declared service members are eligible to be assigned in all positions for which they are qualified, except that women shall be excluded from assignment units that below the brigadier level whose primary mission is to 
direct combat on the ground. So that policy excluded women from being assigned to certain organizations based on their proximity to combat or co collection as policy, the spot policy specifically referred to it. According to the army, collection occurred when the position or army routinely physically locates and remains with a military unit assigned to a doctrinal mission to routinely engage in direct combat. So as time has gone on, at this point, women were starting to serve closer to combat. Leanne Hester served in the Iraq War, and she received the Silver, Silver Star for her actions in March of 2005 during an enemy ambush on a supply convoy near Salman Park, Iraq. This was the first female U.S. Army soldier to receive the Silver, Silver Star since World War II, and the first ever to be cited for valor in close quarter combat. Women in the Army currently ser also have served in Afghanistan, and Anne Dunway became the first female four-star general in 2008, and also the first four-star general in all, all military branches. In 2011, Patricia Harnot became the first female Army Surgeon General. In 2013, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta removed the military's ban on women serving in combat, period, overturning the 94 ruling. Panetta's decision gave the military services until 2016 to seek special exemptions for any, any positions that they wanted to still close to women, and they... and. It took them until 2015 to actually implement opening up all branches to females. In August of 2015, the first two women to graduate from ra the first two women graduated from Ranger School in two in October 2015. The Lisa Jester became the third woman to graduate from this from this school and the first one from the Army Reserves. In April 2016. Kristen Marie Greist became the first female infantry officer of the U.S. Army when the Army approved her request to transfer there from a military police unit. In September 2015, Ranger School was permanently open to women, and in 2019, 30 women earned the Army Ranger Tap. April of 2016, Tammy Barnett became the first woman to enlist in the infantry in the U.S. Army, and Kristen Marie Greist became the first female infantry officer in the U.S. Army when the Army approved her, her transfer request from the, a military police unit. Shelby Atkins became the first female U.S. non-commissioned officer to be granted the infantry military occupational specialty. In October 2016, 10 women became the first female graduates from the United States Army Infantry Basic Officer Leadership Course at Fort Benning. In 2017, 18 women graduated from the U.S. Army's first gender integrated infantry basic training for enlisted soldiers. In 2019, Laura Yeager became the first woman to lead an Army Infantry Division. And we will be hearing about more first as time goes on. But this is the end of this episode's Sexy Politico podcast. Thank you for listening. I'll be spending my New Year holiday holiday quietly with my husband and son getting over this cold and praying that 2021 looks nothing like 2020 thank you again for listening see y'all next week happy new year stay sexy and safe bye